Welcome to Kelly's Island and part one of our walking tour of historic sites and houses. This will be East Lakeshore from the ferry boat to the downtown area. As you know, we are located about four and a half miles from the mainland. You must take a ferry to get here and there are two main landing areas, Seaway Marina if you take the Kelly's Island Ferry and the downtown dock if you arrive on the Jet Express. When viewing this slideshow, just hit the pause button to read about whichever location you are standing in front of. Please remember all the houses are private and not open to the public. We know it's tempting, but please do not bother the owners or trespass on their property. Assuming you have just docked at the Seaway Marina, most people who don't bring their cars over will rent a golf cart. This is a great way to tour the entire island, but if you are just exploring our south shore in downtown, it's a short and pleasant walk. You can easily start downtown and work backwards, too. It's an easy walk from either location and contains some of the earliest and more interesting buildings and historic sites on the island. Oh yes, our thanks to Leslie Karenko, island historian, for putting this tour together. She hopes you enjoy it. Site number one, Seaway Marina. Now a thriving marina, this was once part of Addison Kelly's holdings. Addison was the son of Datus and Sarah Kelly. The island was named after Datus and his brother Irad. Originally a swamp and home to the mosquito fleet, the swamp eventually dried up somewhat and in 1896 celery was grown here. In 1958 a marina development was approved and the road along the beach was relocated. The former swamp was excavated and a channel was cut to the lake. This turned the former swamp into a smaller version of the marina you see today. Site number two, Professor Hummel's house. Built around 1925, this house was used as a summer home by Professor Hummel of the Western Reserve University's chemistry department. He was one of several Cleveland professionals who bought Addison Kelly's mansion. They call themselves the Sportsman's Club. The current owner, Caroline DeBoard, bought the property in 1968 and after almost doubling the size and renovating the old cottage, it is now a private home and a bed and breakfast. Note the unusual silver metal barn in the rear of the property. Site number three, that house overlooking the lake. This is one of just a few homes built along the lake shore. This unusual house was built by Alice and W. Huber of Cleveland in 1932. He was one of the members of the Sportsman's Club, whose headquarters were in Kelly's mansion. The house was built entirely by local workers, using island materials, including limestone and beach stones from Long Point. A Native American burial site was discovered when a water line was installed to the cottage from the main water line on the north side of the road. A small Native American inscription was found on the large rock that forms the west base of the house. Sorry, you won't be able to see it. Site number four, Henry Lang's house. This is one of the few stone houses on the island. It dates back to 1862. Before St. Michael's Catholic Church was built, services were held in one wing of the house and later the Catholic school began here. Henry had one of the earliest wineries on the island on this site. In 1880, he built a combination saloon and small hotel near the road on the left side of the house. It was demolished in the early 1980s and the wood was reused to build an addition onto the outbuilding in the back of the house. And look closely, just to the left is an outhouse. There are over 50 outhouses on the island. Site number five, Addison Kelly's house. We islanders refer to this house as Kelly's mansion. Construction began in 1862, but work soon slowed down because of the impact of the Civil War on costs, supplies, and manpower. It was finally completed in 1867. The partition walls are built of stone and there are eight cellars. The main hall is 21 by 8 feet and opens into a rotunda 18 feet in diameter. In the center is a spiral staircase that leads to the halls and rooms above. 
This staircase is incredibly unique. It is self-supporting, with the steps fastened together from the inside in groups of three. The ceiling of the rotunda is a beautiful stained glass window, composed of eight panes of ruby glass surrounding a deep blue panel similar to the Great Seal of the United States. And yes, it is privately owned. Site number six, look across the street. This is Inscription Rock. An early description of the rock indicated it was almost covered by the earth bank and inscriptions were deeply cut into the rock. By 1866, the engravings were rapidly disappearing. Addison Kelly worked with photographer W.A. Bishop in 1885 to preserve a record of the inscriptions by filling in the engravings with chalk so they could be photographed for posterity. Although weathering has effectively worn away the carvings, a marker on this site shows how the rock looked when it was first discovered. Site number seven, Coster's Dock. Herman Coster built a winery on the upland part of this dock in 1883. Three years later, the lower part of the dock was built and then enlarged in 1889 to facilitate the shipment of his wine. Later, the dock was used by the Sweet Valley, Monarch, and the Myers Wine Companies. From 1907 to 1945, it was owned by the Kelly's Island Lime and Transport Company. From 1921 to 1956, it was used by the Lay Brothers Fish Company. Later, the Kelly's Island Fish Producers Co-op used the dock as a packing and transfer station for local fisheries. Commercial fishing shut down in the 1960s, and since then the dock and building have served as a private marina under various names. If you look closely, you can see a large net reel near the building. That was used by the fishermen. Site number eight, the Bowling Alley House. This little yellow house was once the rear part of a large saloon and bowling alley associated with the Himmeline House next door. A part of the saloon can be seen on the far right in the old picture. It was built in 1886. The two-story saloon was demolished and the porch added, and in 1943, another 30-foot section in the rear was removed. All that remains is the old bowling alley, or Skittles Alley. In 1888, Nichols' handy guide noted that it was a place where one could partake of billiards, skittles, and fine cigars. To keep the integrity of the alley, almost all the interior walls stop several feet short of the ceiling. Site number nine, the Himalayan House Hotel. In 1859, John Himmeline built a small home on this site. That would be the center first floor section. He was a popular host, and in 1861, he added a wing to each side. Two years later, he added a saloon on the property and was growing grapes and serving the resultant wine to his guests. John died in 1879, but his widow took over the hotel. And in 1882, she added a third floor the hotel could accommodate 100 guests. In 1886, the bowling alley billiard room and a larger saloon were built. That would be the yellow house that you just passed. John Jr. became involved in the theatrical business and brought his troupe to the island during the summer. Using local talent, they put on shows in preparation for their fall and winter tours. The hotel ceased operation in 1915. Site number 10, Bayview Cottage. The original house on the site was destroyed by fire in 1896. The owner, William Moisey, a grape grower and the secretary of the Sweet Valley Wine Company, rebuilt the house you see here. The hotel he and his wife Elizabeth owned was known as Bayview Cottage. The Moisey family ran the hotel until the 1950s. The doors to the rooms still have the hotel room numbers on them. You can see that there is an old red barn in the backyard. It is one of about 20 barns still left on the island. Even though these were prestigious lakefront homes, they were still working farms. Site number 11, Henry Beatty's house. In 1948, Godfrey Shook, a master stonemason, built this impressive house for Henry and Rosetta Beatty. 
Henry was the son of German immigrant Louis Beatty. Henry was one of the last successful commercial fishermen in the west basin of Lake Erie. He served on the village council and as mayor from 1948 to 1958, as well as being the first ranger administrator of the Kelly's Island State Park. This stone house was the last major project undertaken by Mr. Shook before he retired. Site number 12, Cricket Lodge. John Himmeline Jr. built this lovely home in 1906. He became involved with the theatrical group one summer when the company booked rooms at his parents' hotel, the Himmeline House. In 1894, John married the Howard Wall Company's star, Beatrice Wheel, known by her stage name as Beatrice Earl. John was known as the King of the Repertoire. He owned and managed several theaters and ten acting companies across the U.S. With the arrival of movies, his companies broke up in the 1930s. The house passed to John and Beatrice's daughter, Mrs. Dorothy's son, and in 1984 to Chris and Frank Yako. It has had just three owners. Site 13, The Park. Now known as the Downtown Park or Veterans Park, this was once the site of the first permanent home of island founders Datus and Sarah Kelly. The Kellys built their home here in 1843. They called it the Island House. It became a popular place for visitors, so much so that they had to add a hotel wing on the left side in 1852. In 1858, a third story was added. In 1873, Jacob Rush bought the property and built a 102-room hotel here. It was 224 feet wide and three stories tall. It featured such amenities as a bowling alley, billiard parlor, bathhouses, a laundry, barber shop, livery stable, and an open-air dancing pavilion overlooking the lake. A fire destroyed the structure in November 1877. George Shart built a smaller building on the corner lot in 1892, but it burned down a few years later. John Himmeline bought the property in 1905 and sold it to the village for use as a park 20 years later. You have arrived in the island's downtown area. Site number 14. Look down the hill towards the lake. This was the main steamboat dock. While boats could dock anywhere, this dock was the main landing area. Early pictures show a wooden bridge leading to a small dock. But cordwood was a major commodity, and islanders cut and stacked wood and left it on the dock near the bank for sale to the wood-fired steamboats when they stopped. The dock grew larger and larger, finally accommodating a series of warehouses and stores. January Coucher built a saloon near the shore, across from the casino. However, it caught fire and burned in 1915. Later, the Newman Boat Line docked their ferries here. Site number 15, the casino. Just down the hill is the casino. Now a popular restaurant, it was originally a boathouse with an open-air dancing platform on the roof built for the Island House Hotel. Ten years after the hotel burned, August Shedler bought the building, remodeling it to include a saloon and restaurant. Since it was just up from the steamboat dock, it became a popular place to wait for the boats. There were separate accommodations for women to partake in a cool lemonade while they waited, and in another area, the men could order something more bracing and smoke a cigar or two. In 1901, Charles Himmeline bought the property and the building became officially known as the casino. Site number 16, the lodge. Uh, it's not what you think. Built around 1854, this corner building was the island's first full-service general store. It was originally called the store on the corner, but rapidly became known as the lodge. It was the home of the independent order of island loafers, and every island man automatically became a lodge member. The building was also the home of the island's first post office in 1866, and the store's manager, Erastus Huntington, was our first postmaster. Due to its location at the corners and just up the hill from the dock, 
It became the place to get all the latest news. For many years, it was owned by the Matzo family and was called Matzo's Place, The Lodge. In 1992, the building underwent a massive renovation and the brick exterior replaced the wood siding. Site number 17, the village pump. In 1884, Frederick Elfers was appointed the new postmaster, and in 1890, he moved the post office from his Division Street store to this building, which was built by Gus Kelly. There was also a barber shop on the second floor, a social hall, and a doctor's office here. In 1915, the post office again moved out, and the barber, Emmett Martin, converted the post office space to a confectionery. Later, as automobiles became more popular, he installed gas pumps and sold oil and auto and farm equipment parts. During Prohibition, a pool table was set up in an addition, which was actually a quarry building that was moved to the site. After Prohibition, Charles Martin set up a bar in the main section and the former pool hall became an ice cream parlor. The building was expanded several times and a third floor added for living quarters. Site number 18. Okay, let's walk back to the intersection. This was known as the corners. As you stand at the corners, take a good look and compare it to the old pictures. These were taken around 1911. On the right, you can see part of the general store in Kelly's Hall and on the left, the reading room, which would later become the island's meat market and is now the island market, as well as Elfer's second store. You can learn more about these stores in part two of our walking tour. This is a great time to stop and get something cool to drink as we close out part one of our walking tour. Watch for part two, the downtown and Division Street, down to Kelly's Island History Museum. If you want more information on the history of the island, we recommend visiting the Kelly's Island History Museum. Their website is www.kellysislandhistorical.org and on Facebook they are the Kelly's Island History Museum. And visit Leslie Karenko, Island Historian and Author. Her website is www.kellysislandstory.com.